This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode, alongside my co-host Bob Pastorella, we chat with masters of horror about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. And today's guest is Josh Malaman. We've been through a lot together. He first was on the podcast to discuss Bird Box. That was around the time of release. I remember it was my original co-host, Dan Howarth, who had told me about Bird Box and Josh Malaman. And I read it and was absolutely blown away by it. It's one of my favorite books. So it's an honor and a privilege to now call Josh a friend Of course, if you listen back to that episode, it's pre-episode 100, but you'll be able to tell that me and Josh and, of course, Dan, we all get on really well right away. So for completists of the This Is Horror podcast, you might want to go back and listen to that one. But, I mean, shortly following that conversation, I was speaking to Josh about whether we could collaborate And so I asked him if he had anything that he might consider submitting for the This Is Horror Publishing novella line. And we worked together on A House at the Bottom of a Lake. And now fast forward a few years later, and Josh Malaman's film manager, Ryan Lewis, is also my film manager. And I'm also part of a group known as The Prolifics, which we get into a little bit in this conversation. So a lot of personal history with Josh, and I mean the reason that we got together for this conversation is of course because of the release of Mallory, the sequel to Bird Box, and we do talk about that, although that will be coming up more in the second part, but in this conversation we talk about the idea of making it. We talk about how Josh has 14 stories in development for film and TV. We talk about his production company. We, of course, talk about the aforementioned Ryan Lewis. And hey, much, much more. But as always, before any of that, a quick word from our sponsors. Save Nightscape Press from going out of business. Help fund Secret Gateways in the Color Trade paperback edition of Knox Paradolia. Nightscape Press has been publishing quality weird and horror fiction since 2012, with an emphasis on supporting notable charities. Search for Secret Gateways on Kickstarter and support to receive rare and awesome perks at various tiers, ebook bundles, paperback and hardcover editions, signed chapbooks, and more. Thank you for your support. Being an independent publisher, we are just like you. We share the same passion, the same love for horror fiction. We believe in the incredible work being created, unnoticed by the mainstream. And we want to share it with the world. We are the Sinister Horror Company. All right, with that said, here it is. It is a conversation with Josh Malaman on This Is Horror. So, Josh, welcome back to This Is Horror. We were last speaking to you in episode 300, which already is over 50 episodes ago. So I think we must be churning out these episodes pretty quickly to be that far along. That is really crazy because when what what's the date on that on the, um, th- number three hundred? So I think it was sometime last year. I think it was was it maybe about September or so. So it's not even been a year yet, and we've I, we've cranked out yeah. over fifty more. <laughs> that, 
crazy. Not even close to a year yet. And you have, so is that normal? Do you do about 65 a year, 60 a year, or is it all over the place? So, I mean, the way, the standard way that we do it is we guarantee at least one episode per week. But then you may have noticed that I'll have these kind of mad creative drives where I'm normally trying to increase our Patreon. And I'm like, right, if we hit X amount of patrons, then we're putting out two episodes per week for the next two months. And then that happens and I have to actually do it. So I think that is <laughs> that is what's happened. I mean, at the moment, I'm back in Japan and as well as doing the writing and this is horror and all of that, I'm also teaching full time. So I think because of that, the pace is invariably slowing down a little bit. But then with the teaching as well, we have like these these various vacations. I've got the whole of August off, so there could be a two episodes per week stint coming in the not too distant future. Wow, you're back in Japan and it um I uh, was traveling weird, bizarre with all this stuff or no it, what, what was I mean if you don't want to go to go into it, don't, but was it pretty wild? Well, I mean that there's been a few complications, so I I got into Japan with about 18 hours to go until they were saying no British citizens are allowed to be in Japan. They they banned uh, uh, British citizens because of COVID-19. And originally that was till the end of April, but then they extended it till the end of May, then the end of June. And I'm kind of expecting them to extend it until at least the end of July because I think if they were going to lift it they would have been talking about that now and the only thing sure. they've been talking about is letting people in and easing restrictions from Australia, New Zealand, Thailand and Vietnam because those are four countries that seem to really have it under wraps at the moment but then the personal complication for me is the way that the visa works is traditionally the person with the main job will come in first and then a few weeks later the other members of the family will come in. But because they decided that British citizens couldn't come in, it means that at the moment I'm in Japan and my wife and daughter are still in the UK. So that... <laughs> It's not an ideal situation, but of course, with with technology and things, we've been speaking every day. And I mean, I, I've said this to a few people before, but the good thing is that we anticipated that that might happen. I mean, I think with with COVID, all bets were off. You didn't know, you know, what what yeah. complications there would be. So I think if I hadn't anticipated it, if we hadn't anticipated it, it would be a lot more difficult. But I mean, I I try to be very rational about things and logical. And I mean, I said to my wife, at, at this point, you know, we are, we're separated in terms of being a continent away. We can't do anything to alter that whether we choose to be happy or we choose to be sad, the reality isn't going to change. So we're choosing to be happy. We're choosing to get on with things as best as we can. And I mean, that that's working out pretty well. Of course, we miss each other. Of course, we want to be reunited. But th this is a global pandemic. There's nothing that can be done. And hopefully soon we'll be back together. <laughs> There is this sense that, like, um, well, I mean, obviously, that whatever's happening is bigger than, yeah. you know, um, bigger than my, what I want, what my happiness, this kind of thing, my comfort, like, and, it, and it's, it's real easy to sort of, you know, forget or to think for a second that you're the only one going through this, right? And you see, you're like, I'm losing my mind here at home or whatever. And then I hear your story. I'm like, my God, this is... Dude is split up from his wife and daughter, and I'm complaining about like being in my office and yard. Like, shut up, you know. 
And then if I really think about what, um, you know, what has been canceled or whatever, I was supposed to go to uh, San Diego Comic Con. Um, there was one in Seattle. And um, Alice and I were going to Hawaii, which that sounds insane to say out loud, but we were supposed to go there and we that was canceled. And then the reading for Mallory, the um, as you guys know, we do theatrical readings for all of the for every book release and this one was oh my god it was so set up dude dudes and um <laughs> and mm-hmm. it got we had to cancel it and it, it was so incredible the detroit zoo has a train that goes around it you know for like kids really and we got access to that train we were going to blindfold everyone everyone rides the train we narrate the book through like the pa speakers of the train and the train stops at you know at stations where we would have um, you know scenes acting out or acted out for the people live music scary music as scenes are played out oh, just so much awesome stuff I was flying Rue Morgue in for the for the event to just to experience it I was like you guys don't even need to write about it or not I want you to be a part of this um, that was planned so for me though. Okay, so the biggest thing is, all right, you, you missed a few conventions and, and you know, a spectacular reading is, let's just say it's put on hold. And it's exactly what you said. Um, and you, obviously you can apply this to any walk of life, right? This is happening either way. You could choose to be happy or distressed. And you can be both. And, and, it's, and then, you know, that's really like, it's almost like forced perspective right now, right? Because you're, you're, you almost like go out of your mind with without it. And so I'm, I'm in a similar boat as you, but I'm not separated from a child, but I am, but I am, um, consciously deciding to be as bright as possible in this scenario. Yeah. And I think you saying you can be both is important as well. So just because I'm choosing to be happy, it doesn't mean that I'm not allowing myself to have moments where where i'm sad or frustrated at the situation and i think anything where you're trying to force or suppress an emotion is going to be dangerous so you know you feel what you need to feel and i think as well i mean you you say that like obviously you hear about my situation and then think oh oh shit that one's (laughs) pretty rough too but then i could hear about someone who who may be their partner is on life support because of COVID. And so then that right. makes my situation look tame in comparison. And I yep. think really, I mean, the, the idea is try not to compare your situation too much to anyone else's because you'll always find someone who it looks like they have it worse than you and, it, and also someone who it looks like they have it better than you. And just because someone has a worse situation, it doesn't mean that you're not allowed to feel frustrated or or sad or angry about your own. And of course, the great thing is, as I'm saying this, we can apply this immediately to the creative pursuit and to to writing. Yeah. I mean, if if we were to always compare our writing and our success to to someone else, then we could be in a permanent state of depression because you'll always find someone who who's a little bit further along or doing a little bit better than you or you, you feel their writing's better or you feel they're getting more money or they're getting more film deals or whatever metric you want to measure it by. So just be concerned with yourself and, and, and getting better. I was just talking today to Ryan, you know. I um, do. I'll let the audience. Ryan, Ryan Lewis is my manager. He's extraordinary. Um, he, um, we were talking earlier today that the only, and I've always felt this way, the only make, the only quote unquote making it is actually making the work of art. And if that sounds, oh my God, so trying to be so noble and altruistic, it's true. It's like, you know, there were 20 years or, or so of writing, I don't want to say in a vacuum because I was, surrounded by like the craziest bunch of awesome freaks in the world while I was writing all this stuff. But like 20 years of not having a book deal and this and that, and the rough drafts are starting to stack taller than I am and all this. And I, there was never this sense of, am I ever going to make it? It was never that sense. There was this sort of delusional, um, 
voice that always said yes to that that sort of like you like it's going to work out like don't worry it's going to work mm. out but never a sense of like i have to make it it's like oh my gosh you know to me it's like and, and anyone who has a book published and now i have a book on the um new york times bestseller list well bird box not meaning right now but i've had one and a hit movie with bird box and there's i'm here to tell you there's nothing better than finishing the writing of the book nothing nothing will ever beat that and when people write that online and they're like you know there's no feeling like it there dude there really is no feeling like it including any success that may happen beyond the book and to, so to me it's literally making it is literally making it like writing it doing it drawing it you know if you want to be an artist you got to make work of, works of art right <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah and it, it's interesting how with the kind of wider perception and this is something that i've been thinking about because there is interest in the girl in the video and possibly making that into a movie but it it's really Uh, interesting how go on sorry no i know all about that it's it's just awesome i'm so excited you know to because you know ryan and i talk daily and to hear like that side of the interest and then and the buzz that your book is creating dude it's really exciting yeah and in fact, now that you've said that, I'm going to interrupt my own thought with another thought. And this is probably the direction that our conversation is going to go anyway, because there's always so much energy and we're not only interrupting each other, but we're interrupting ourselves. But as as you mentioned, Ryan and what's going on with the girl in the video, I mean, whilst we we have... We had, you know, the coronavirus pandemic and that's still ongoing. And I was separated from my wife and daughter. It was really bizarre because I also had the launch of the girl in the video. And that's just been amazing. I mean, for a debut novella, not even a novel and with an independent publisher, it's gained so much buzz and so much kind of accolades and I mean I have to thank you for first of all for providing me with an advanced quote I know that funnily enough I first spoke to you about that off the air after episode 300 so I feel all these things kind of have some sort of symmetry or a poetry and you said yeah you check out the book you did you liked it you provided that blurb so obviously that got people excited But then I got a couple of film producers interested in things. And so I was speaking to Max and speaking to you. And then suddenly Ryan Lewis, he's like, okay, I'll I'll call Michael. We'll have a chat. We spoke for over an hour, which was kind of insane because like Max had said, he first spoke to him (laughs) for 10 minutes or so. But we just hit it off and we had so much to talk about and then a few days later Ryan is my film manager so like a lot of the good things that have happened with the girl in the video you've played a part and I mean a lot of people have spoken before about people who 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 do things altruistically and and for absolutely no gain to them for, for themselves and this is what you've been doing not just with me, but with Max and with countless others and with Sarah Reed. And so I, I just want to thank you for having such an impact and helping make this weird fucking time, this weird pandemic, a little bit brighter for me. <laughs> that, okay, dude, right on. You know, it's, um, yeah, wow, okay. Um, you know, and, God, I'm like kind of like uh, choked up with words because that was that's just really good to hear. Okay, um, because Ryan, as you know, I like let, let me let's just talk about Ryan for for a minute here. This guy, I meet this guy 12 years ago. I'm uh, at the time the brokest I've ever been. I'm stoned with well, the first time I talked to him on the phone, yeah. and I don't grasp that often. And that day I happened to. And he calls and he's talking to me about being a manager and all this. And I was like so scared. Like I didn't even know what these words meant, you know? And I'm like, and he's my age. So, so we were about the same age and he definitely seemed warm and smart and cool and all this. 
And again, I'm stoned though. And I'm like, what does this mean? And then what do you mean you want to manage me? Well, like, I don't even know what this means, right? And then we we get off the phone and I, there was, you know, I was with a bunch of friends because we all kind of lived in a flop house. And I go back in and I had this sort of moment of like ab- just abject horror, this wave, this rush of like, am I like ready for whatever comes next? Because talking to this guy felt like something was coming next. And, and not in a Hollywood like, you know, huckster way, not in a name dropping way. It sounded like it sounded like I had met someone with a similar worldview and work ethic that I have, but but he um, had access to doors I couldn't even, you know, I didn't even know the, what building they were in, right? And so I remember like literally sitting on this front porch and then in this house, like just truly scared. Like, are you ready for what? And then the high wore off and I was like, yeah, dude, shut up. You know, like, this is all great. And then so through the years, Ryan kept saying, Listen, I'm I'm telling you, I'm going to get Bird Box um, picked up the second that you get a book deal. And he kept saying it up. And maybe I've told you guys the story before, but it, it's just worth repeating because Ryan, because of Ryan, really. And he kept saying, I'm going to get this picked up by film. And and I had no real reason to believe him. I think I was his first novelist. He had never exactly done this before. Anyway, Bird Box gets picked up uh, by Harper Collins and like. Four months later, Ryan had it uh, optioned by Universal. And I was like, I had just spent three years with him, three years before that happened of just just blind faith that that this dude was gonna do this because there's a bedside manner to everything and Ryan's bedside manner to managing and to meetings and his ideas and his notes is just freaking smart. It's direct, it's... Um, uh, level-headed, it, it, again, no name-dropping or giant numbers. It's just all very, like, why can't we do this? And, 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 and me, too. Like, why? you're right. Why can't we do this? So this leads to nowadays, at some point after Bird Box the movie, Ryan said, um, hey, I think that we should start thinking of ourselves as a production company, spin a black yarn, and let's actually look, you know, for other people's stories. Because we were starting to get... <clears throat> we were starting to get um, a number of my books and short stories like placed uh, uh, or optioned and that kind of thing, right? And so then he was like, let's try this with other people. And then he started working with Richard Chismar and Lindsay Barlow and Laura Libar and and starting to, to get like results with them. And then you, Max, um, Jonathan Jans. And it's like all of a sudden Ryan who, you know, when I met him, I was his first novelist, and him and I, it feels like him and I took peyote in the desert for three years. That's how (laughs) it feels to me now, you know? Like with this wonderfully idealistic and and why not period that we had, and still are having. But to now have, I don't want to say that he has a stable, that sounds funny, but, but the people that he is working with, you, Jans, Max, me, it's just like, I don't know, man. They all sort of reflect him in a weird way. Smart, hardworking, um, usually prolific, uh, men and women f- filled with ideas, open to um, a, a, a blockbuster movie path or the smallest indie path imaginable, just open-minded creatives, or, or as I like to now use as a noun, prolifics. Ryan works with a lot of prolifics and and like-minded modern men and women. And he, yeah, dude, he, he's suddenly become like, like this awesome horror manager. <laughs> yeah. I still can't get that image out of my head. When you said, when you said meeting in the desert and remind me of that scene from a uh, domino when Tom Waits shows up just like out of the blue and, uh, oh. and gives a, what's her name? Kiera Knightley, the, the coin. And, uh, I just had this vision of you and and all these people tripping on peyote in the desert, like listening to Caius, you know, <laughs> and just like just just getting just like tripping. And I was like, I can't get that image out of my head, but it, it, it's so cool because you get like this feeling. You said prolifics, but it's almost like a tribe. It's like really really cool. 
Yeah, it really is, man. And he's constantly asking me about, you know, other people. And, and, and in fact, he's kind of um, stopped asking me because now he's discovering just on his own. He's like on Twitter looking up, you know, new releases, novellas, novels, um, looking into authors and this kind of stuff. And he'll bring up people to me. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know her. You know, that kind of thing. And I, I'm like, you, how do you do? He's like, oh, you know, I discovered her through this path, whatever. And so, yeah, it's been amazing. And I, it's like I have this, I cannot wait. And my gosh, I, I hope this happens. But I cannot wait till, you know, Girl in the Video, let's say. It's like a movie. And, we're, and we all go to the premiere and party together. Ryan, you, me. You know, I just, I don't know. I, I fantasize about that moment of just like, all of us like having a drink over like your movie, you know, something yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah. <laughs> that would yeah. be like an apex yeah. life moment right there for everybody involved. Right, yeah. And you've gotta come too, Bob, and we gotta get Max and we gotta get Jan. <laughs> we gotta get all these people. They're all amazing <laughs> people. Well, and the prolifics, the tribe. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I would love to set up some sort of I don't want to say retreat. We could all just sit around and do nothing, but but something where everyone that's working with Brian, we all hang out somehow for a weekend. And I don't know what that means. I'll, I'm, I'm going to look into that and I'm going to think about that. And obviously that's not going to happen anytime soon. But I think that that could be really fun. Jonathan Jans drove up here from Indiana. Um, I think he's about four and a half hours away. And he drove up the night that we hosted the brilliant um, paranormal investigator, John Tenney. I don't know if you guys know John Tenney, but oh my God. He gave a lecture at our house. Allison and I hosted him. Everyone got, everyone maybe got too drunk and stoned, and, and I would like to do it again where we, we, we stay a little more in check until he's done. But the, the, the lecture was absolutely mind-blowing, and Jonathan Jans came to it. He drove the four and a half hours, showed up at my house, and, and John Tenney had read his books and known him, and, and Jonathan was excited about Tenney's lecture, and there was like 60 people here, and everyone's drinking and smoking, and we're talking about ghosts and ufos and 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 i'm like i want to do that again and i want you know all all like you and max and Lindsay and everyone uh to come over and let's make a freaking like ryan lewis party yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh that, that's amazing and i mean t talking about films and development i know there's not too much you can say but you said a couple of days <laughs> ago that you now have 14 of your novels or stories in development for film and TV. And I mean, that that is something that's amazing and something where, you know, I mean, you've got to take your own advice. And one of the, the great things you said to me was, you know, when you get some good film news or any good news, be excited now, because then if it actually is made into a film, you get to be excited twice. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Yes. That, yeah, yeah, you said it better, I feel like. But I did say that to you. You're right. I did. I did write you that. Um, but I would like to I would like to take a little clip of what you just said and then like post it in like my room somewhere and I yeah. can just play. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so like you know, it's almost maddening when good news comes in about a book and you're not allowed to talk about it. Not maddening because you're some ungrateful lunatic who needs his ego stroke, but just maddening because it's like so exciting and you know it would help the book. And you know, a million things, you're just like, oh my God. But then it has turned into like a whole sort of slew of um, projects where Ryan and I are like, agree early on, like, yeah, no, no, no. If you don't want us to talk about it, we won't, you know. And just recently, Ryan said to me, he's like, we got to stop being so nice about that part of it. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's like, for, for now on, we got to just be like, hey, yeah, we're going we're gonna to just do this. You know, we're, we're, sorry. Or we're going to leak it somehow. Right. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. But then some of them, I'm trying to think how many, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like eight or nine of them, the scripts I've already read. And... Damn. Yeah, mm -hmm. and some of them are, I, well, you know that Black Mad Wheel is, um, I have posted about that one, and I posted that I printed up the script written by Barnett Brettler, and he, he sent in, the original script was like 190 pages or something, 
And it's one of the greatest things I've ever read, guys. I, I knew they were going to make him rewrite it. And by the way, I'm a producer on it. So when I say they, I guess that means me. But there's no way in hell I'm going to ever tell someone, you know, you should chop this down. No way. I wanted 50 more pages. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but I knew that the others, the others, I knew the others were going to um, ask him to chop it down. So I printed it out. And it's the only other thing I keep with my rough drafts with all the stuff that I wrote in these crates, these crazy looking crates in my office is that Barnett Brettler script because it was so freaking good, guys. And I was like, dude, I called him up and, and he's a really interesting guy. He's young, um, super intelligent. I got hammered with him in L.A. last time I was out there. Um, and and he just wrote this mammoth, just epic script in this sort of grand Spielberg way. And I was like, if you can imagine that version of Black Mad Wheel, just like a sort of like epic adventure with with horror, like underlying tones of horror, you know? And I was like, oh my God, this is this is it. And so that script is has been rewritten and is out in the world and blah 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 stuff. You know, we'll see what, what comes of it. But that's um that's kind of like the only one that I can even freaking talk about. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'll tell you something of yours that I was really excited about, which you absolutely can talk about. And I mean, as much as I was excited for Bird Box, when I saw that you were working, and I might I might pronounce his name wrong, but with Sky Elobar, who was in Greasy Strangler and Beverly Laughlin, like I lost my mind because I love that guy. Oh. I think he's such an amazing actor. So I think it was a short story of yours. And so James Henry Hall is the director and he, um, him and I love the greasy strangler. It's like the, one of the craziest freaking movies you've ever seen. <laughs> it's so quotable as well. There are so many moments <laughs> in that film. <laughs> and, and James was like, Hey, can I make a short out of, uh, a Ben Evans film, your short story? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, do we have to even go? I'm like, no, just do it. Sounds great. And he was like, who should we get to play Ben Evans? I'm like, I don't know. And then he's like, what if I wrote Sky Alabar, you know, from the Greasy Strangler? And I was like, dude, that would be the, I mean, that would be like, like a coup or something if you pulled that off, you know? So he, um, he wrote him directly, um, talked to him on the phone and, and Sky agreed. Sky comes to Michigan, James and this brilliant cinematographer. Oh, there's, there's two directors, James and James's uncle, Brett. Um, and this great cinematographer, John Beavers, and Sky Alabar is here in Michigan and they're filming Ben Evans film and and I'm on set and I'm like, this is so crazy. And it was such a great experience. And then afterwards, everyone came to my house, like during the, I guess you would say the rap party. Sky came over and he's like a wine connoisseur and I didn't know that. How could I know that? And he was like, we got this bottle of wine for him and and we all hung out. It was an amazing night. Um, and then at some point after that, it was like, we need to now shop this short um, as a feature. And so that is going on with a Ben Evans film is that James, me, Ryan, Sky, and Brett are trying to get a feature made of that short. Man, I really, really hope that that comes together. I mean, as you and Ryan would yeah. say, Marty Feldman. <laughs> which is going to be yeah. very weird for the listeners wondering what the fuck I'm talking about. It's going to be weird for Bob, Sorry, that... but we'll, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's our, it's our secret code for good luck. Hey, hey, you should. Uh... Oh my God. Both my dogs are like trying to climb on me suddenly. Yeah. Well, that's fine. Let them. Let them. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're just getting excited by all, all these developments. They couldn't contain themselves. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, with, with your production company, Spin a Black Yarn, is there anything you can tell us about that? I mean, obviously, you've told us a little bit about how it came about. But what about in terms of some of the films that you're looking to produce? Well, you know, it's interesting that you asked that because recently we were asked in a phone call, like, what exactly are you looking for? Because, um... It seems to me that I've put all because almost everything I read, I'm like, dude, this this should be a movie. This could be a movie. This, you know, you know, you know. So at some point, Ryan's like, you say that about everything, but <laughs> but I believe yeah. that about everything. 
And so it's kind of become he's he's more of the I guess he's sort of sort of more of the final word on that front. If he's like, no, that yeah, the, I can shop this, then there we go. So then it but there doesn't really seem to be a underlying unifier between all of them, right? The girl in the video, bird box, um, black man wheel. I don't I don't know if there's like, you know, I don't know if it's a lack of brutality or it's a slow burn or not, or these things. And Ryan, Ryan, if he was on here, which, by the way, I don't know if he would ever do that, but have you considered interviewing him? Or is that just crazy? God, he might he might freak out if he had to do something like this, man. Um, no, we, we, we can chat with Ryan. Um, I mean, we probably, yeah. we probably shouldn't add him in prompt you to the call right now. That might be a little bit harsh, but we should, we should definitely do it at some time. I mean, like, like I said, the first time we spoke, we just fucking spoke for an hour so to have that kind of chemistry and to be able to do that like it's going to be absolutely no issue chatting with him for the podcast it'll just be a matter of whether that's something he wants to do but yeah i should talk to him about it because I, th I think as well i mean we spoke to to Kristen a number of years ago now and so th these are, are people who you don't always hear from you know a film manager that's a pretty unique perspective we haven't had that on this is horror so yeah. yeah that would be super interesting i think for listeners ex exactly because like if i heard you know that um you know victor laval's manager or whatever was on i would be like oh, i'm gonna well, what 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 are they gonna talk about that's gotta be different you know yeah so mm -hmm. like that yeah that's definitely huh Anyway, so I don't really, you know, with Ryan, it seems like I don't really know exactly what it is, but whatever it is, it seems to sing to him right away when he reads something. And I don't know if he's looking for, you know, something that's cinema ready, cinematic immediately, because it doesn't seem like he's um, again, he's a, it's not like he's afraid of a slow burn. Um, I do know that neither of us are like like f like fully attracted to something that's maybe brutality first or hyper realistic brutality right um, right yeah. like a, of of you know i don't know like a um like a, a man or woman being held prisoner and tortured forever i don't i don't know if something along those like that might be like oh i don't know maybe maybe it depends on how it's done right i don't know if we would in other words i think we're probably less the girl next door and more and more the girl in the video <laughs> yeah 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 that that makes a lot of sense i oh. mean uh, up up until that point i was gonna say it seems like you know it, it it's story first and it's characters first but then the moment you said you're not the girl next door it's like well there's a hell of a lot of characterization and a good story in that one i mean dallas i know i yeah i know and that, that was that's why I was hesitant to rule that out, to be honest with you, because it's like, actually, yeah, no, that can be amazing. And we all know that. So, yeah, so well, I don't well, know. They, they did make a film out of it. It was pretty good. Yeah. Really? Did you? I never I haven't seen that. I don't I don't even know if I could bring myself to watch it. That book. I handed that book to my friend James, who made a Ben Evans film. Yeah. yeah. And he he read it and handed it back to me, pinched between his forefinger and thumb as if I, he was handing back like a you know, like, like a diseased rag or something. He, he handed it back to me like, oh, uh, here you go. Thanks for lending me this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that might have been the first book that, that I read where at the end I just kind of broke down in tears because it's such oh, yeah, a dude. fucking emotional ride. And I mean, it, it's based off a real life case as well. And it's so unrelenting and you know you you're looking for that that light and i mean it, it, oh. I, I i don't even know what what to say in terms of it, it's weird whether to give spoilers to something that actually happens so then it doesn't even become a spoiler but let's say you know it, it it's unrelenting and you're looking for that light and maybe there isn't a light it's it's a, it's a very traumatic mm -hmm. journey and uh -huh. i mean it, in, yeah. in lesser hands than than dallas mayer than jack ketchum yeah. it just wouldn't have worked or it would have seemed gratuitous or insensitive but i i think you know he he absolutely had the chops to do that and it, it's it's one of the best 
novels within genre, but it it sure as fuck is not comfortable. I mean, it, well, yeah. we, we we spoke about maybe trigger warnings or content warnings. It's like if ever you needed just like a, a warning on the front of a book, it's that one right there. I can't <laughs> think of of many really that, is. that are more brutal. And it's like. 40 years old or something and it's still like that it's like that book man that would be the equivalent right didn't it come out in like 80 something like that right um i'm i'm, I'm trying to remember because that there, there are two books that are based on the same case because there's also one by mendel johnson i think it's called let's go play at the adams and I, so i think yeah, that, i have that so I think that one came out the same year as Carrie, which I'm wondering, what, was that 78 or something like that? And then The Girl Next Door came out a few years later, but then Let's Go Play at the Adams was, was largely unknown. And it was only recently, in fact, that more people started to, to, to become aware of it, but... I mean, for me, I yeah, find... Yeah, it was that, a paperback from hell. Yeah, because I found out about Let's Go Play at the Adams, I guess, in about 2010, 2011, because I was speaking to the British horror author Joseph De Lacey, and I was telling him how The Girl Next Door was one of you know, the best but most brutal novels I've read, and he was like, oh, you need to check out Let's Go Play at the Adams, and I was like yeah yeah I, I definitely will and he's like no you don't understand so he get he just gave me a copy of the book he's like you need to read it now <laughs> um so yeah. so i did and i mean that that was very well done but i would say that i think for me jack ketchum's the girl next door was more effective but then it's difficult to know was it more effective because I experienced it for the first time, you know, and like experienced that case for the first time. It's it's difficult to know, but it, I I did feel that the girl next door seemed less dated and more more in the moment, whereas there were a few things about Mendel Johnson's book that seemed yeah you know, yeah you know, a, a little bit old and didn't stand up so well. Um, and as I've oh, been saying uh, all that, The Girl Next Door was 1989, so wow, I guess there was about a decade no between them. No way. Can't be 89, The Girl Next Door? No. No, no, no. I, it's got to be like, no, hold on. Are you looking it up? Yeah, yeah. That, that, I mean, don't always trust Wikipedia, but that is what <laughs> Wikipedia is <laughs> saying. So the, the, the Sylvia Likens <laughs> case was... 65 the novel apparently was 89 and then the film was 2007 wow it seems like it was i don't know why it seemed like, so 30 years then yeah 30 something. and that that would be the equivalent uh, like and it's still like we all still consider that like the flagship of what we're talking about right now that would be the equivalent of when that came out think in that way of a book from like the late 50s i mean that's how powerful that freaking book is can you imagine in mm -hmm. 1990 saying that the most powerful horror novel you ever read was from 1957 or something like no way it really man that one that one really did something and it's one of the only times i've ever wanted to reach into a novel and change and stop what was happening like like i, I like physically wanted to help my like i wanted to help them <laughs> yeah yeah anyway okay well that was yeah now we're now we're all like whoa sometimes i'll sometimes i'll just be like at like a party or something or a family gathering and i'll just stare off into space and they're all like what are you thinking about josh and i'm like off season <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah oh my god <laughs> <laughs> I still haven't finished reading uh, The Girl Next Door. God damn it, Bob. What are you doing? Uh, Why are you even on this call? And, uh, <laughs> you should and, uh, be reading The Girl Next Door. And <laughs> it really got to me. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And I wasn't in a good place to read it. So I just, I, I you know, I, I put it aside. 
and I've never gone back to it. And I mean, you know, and what I read was like really, really well written and good. It's the actual content that, you know, it's like you can, you think that you can write like the most disturbing thing. And you, and, and if you think it, you can, but then you read something that's really disturbing. And you're like going, Oh man, I don't even know. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of how yeah. I felt. Yeah, same, dude. And 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 if, and one of the things about that book and about him in general, off season is like this too, is that it it's it the first like the first third or whatever has this like almost like beat writer sense, this like just like this like this like the soul of a of a poet writing, you know, like you're like mm -hmm. oh. I've heard this book is unbearable. So far, so good. And then it's like, oh well, they met on a rock, this boy and this girl, and uh, oh, they're like looking at fish. And okay, I can, I can handle this. And then all of a sudden, you're like, uh oh, oh no, 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 no. And then it's all like downhill, like falling off a cliff from there. But there's something about in off seasons the same thing. There's something about that first stretch that um, that I don't want to say it lulls you in, but it it's almost like Jack Catcher is saying like. It's like he's taking a bow, like, just so you know, like, I'm about to perform for you. I'm a very, like, I'm a real, I'm a wonderful writer. And now here we go. And it's like, oh, man. It's like, he. it's almost like he, like, pulls you in with this just brilliant, gorgeous openings. And then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. it's the brutal thing you've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's how I felt. It, it's like... I used to say, and I still say it about reading Peter Straub. It's like, you know, Peter, when you start reading a Peter Straub book, he, you know, he holds you by the hand. He shows you the path. He leads you on the way and he lets you go on your own. And pretty soon you realize that the hand that, that you're holding is, is not his anymore. It's, you know, it's the, the ghost, the thing, the, the entity and it, and it's guiding you. And it's like, if you read, if when you read the, the girl next door, <laughs> It's like Jack didn't even hold you by the hand. He just like, here's the path. And then next thing you know, there's people on the path that are trying to pelt you with rocks. <laughs> you know, and you're just like going, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. This is a beautiful that, path. And now you're trying to kill me. You know? I like you said that and framed that. I, you know, we can move on to any writer to talk about now because what you're, that whole idea of like, Showing someone the past. Stephen King obviously does that too, where it's like, hey, come this way. And like, I'm going to show you or I'm going to tell you this story. I'm going to show you this path. And not every great book has that. I don't even like I don't know if Moby Dick has that, but Moby Dick's a brilliant book. But that that what that sense of the author pulling aside the curtain, Straub mm -hmm. has that. King has that. Jack Ketchum has that. And it's like, there, there's something interesting about that, huh? I'm going to think about it. I don't know if Edgar Allan Poe operates like that. His is more like, welcome to my nightmare, or, or, or like like you're, you're sitting in the same, like, freaked out room as him or something. Um, but that is interesting to think of authors in that way, that you were saying them holding your hand. I, I had never really thought of in that in those terms before. Yeah, I would think that Poe is probably, he's not a hold your hand type of guy. He right. would have been like, here's the door. And, I, you know, like you, you, you have to knock on the door. And, but once you go inside, you know, your, your, your internal, your internal fears take over. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, I and then don't. it's like Lovecraft. It would be the same way. You I knock on the door, like, you go inside and you realize you're the monster. So, yeah. But, you know. <laughs> like how you said, let's, I, let's stick with this analogy for a second because it's interesting. Like Straub actually walks you to that door. But I think that maybe you find that door with Poe because he's he's banging on it in another room. And you're like, what's that noise? I mean, he's right. the most like frenetic, like frantic authors in certain ways. Not all of it, but but a lot of it. And Mel Moby Dick is like that. Um, I read something recently that also had that kind of like, holy cow energy to it. Oh, I'm reading it right now. A Philip Roth book. Um, it's the first time I've ever read him. And it, it too has that just like bouncing off the page energy. And and that is a different thing than the steady hand of a storyteller. It's almost like I, I hear that Walt Whitman is like that. I've never I never read him. Um I haven't yet, I should. Um, but and I'm I'm really attracted to those kind of artists, you know, the 
the ones that are just like so like mm -hmm. so alive that you can feel it like it's just words on a page man but like they're like literally like leaping up at like like crawling around like bugs and bouncing and they're like it's like the words are like in color and but then i also love the kind of authors with that steady hand also yeah it's like it's it's almost like there, there, there's there's multiple different schools of it but i've always felt that about about straub and that's that's the way i would tell people you know to read you know, like hey i want you to read this book and i'd you know i'd loan them like my my copy of ghost story or shadowland and i'd say look you know there's there's a this is don't don't, don't expect the, the, this to start with a bang you know because right. it's not he it, it's well go, ghost story kind of does but you, you still got to you know kind of go in there but i said he's 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 going to lead you down this path and he's going to hold your hand and pretty soon he's going to he's going to let go but you're going to still feel someone holding your hand <laughs> okay, and they're like oh well, that's kind of creepy i'm like yeah, yeah you know so awesome. you can use that analogy on 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 really on on any of them There's some some authors are not going to hold your hand i mean like legati you know you would be on the <laughs> path and realize that 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 not only are you the only one on the path but you really didn't matter to begin with so <laughs> you know <laughs> it's like you, it, it's but that's that's just that's because that's what they do you know that's their that's okay. part of, of what makes their stories you know why you read them um did you know that Legati's from like around where I'm from um now that you say it yes but I didn't snap to that yes yeah uh, yeah him and Kathy Koja are like two I, like whenever I think about that I'm like those two are from here yes you know <laughs> yeah yeah from There's the Detroit lot. area a lot of great minds and great writers and great filmmakers and Evil Dad, the Evil Dad team and every, you know, all that. But Legati and Koja to be from like literally like up the street, you know, is like pretty, pretty badass. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing that you probably haven't had much opportunity to meet up with Legati. He doesn't strike me as the type of person to just like meet up with a lot no. of people, but may maybe Kathy Koja. <laughs> Yeah, me and me and Tommy, we went disco dancing one night. It was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. We drank we drank a bunch of tequila. And just, yeah, oh, it was amazing. Tom's the guy. He's the life of the party. What are you talking about? He was spinning records all night, like ABBA and stuff. No, my God. Yeah, no. I think that he moved to um. I think he moved to Florida or something. I don't even know. He left. He left town quietly, just in this little wisp. Oof, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But oh. Kathy, I was seeing regularly, and she was there that night that um, Jonathan Jans drove up here. Nice. Oh, cool. Yeah. I'm still thinking about that path analogy and how we can apply it to yeah. different writers. And I'm thinking with Haruki Murakami, you'd be walking down the path, then you'd fall down a fucking well. You <laughs> get to the bottom, there's a cat, <laughs> it probably starts talking to you, and then... There's a little light and some jazz music playing, and you follow that light, and God knows what happens from there. <laughs> yeah, I'm, look, the, I'm looking at my bookshelf, thinking of other ones. Yeah, yeah. Like, so Ramsey Campbell, he would hold your hand the whole time, but he would also try to convince you that what you're looking at could possibly not really be anything scary. Oh man, yeah. You know what I mean? But but maybe it is. Do you have Bob? Do you have a favorite Ramsey Campbell book? Man, it's that's really kind of hard. Like, can I have a favorite three? Okay. Uh, yeah, the Parasite, Obsession, mm -hmm. and Incarnate. I need to read Incarnate. I, I heard that that one's um, uh, super like legit scary. From a number of people have told me that. Is that is that right? Yeah, it's kind of like it, it's it, almost it's, like the exact opposite of Obsession. Where you have people who uh, I believe they had um, some type of medicine or something administered to them or therapy be regarding sleep and dreams, and their dreams start to to come alive, and it's it's pretty freaking scary. Wait, and that's what that's what incarnate's about. Mm-hmm. Oh, that sounds amazing, dude. And obsession is almost like the, the polar opposite of that, where a, a pack of friends had made a 
they basically they made a pack. A group of friends had made a pack about something, and it it literally comes back to haunt them and and, and destroys them. And uh, this is pretty pretty gruesome. There's some imagery in the parasite that has stuck with me to this day. Um, that is just you know that I don't know. It, it's and part of it, here's here's the weird thing about it is that even though it's not really fully in the scene, but in Poltergeist two, whenever like with the 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 worm thing that gets in him from the I guess the tequila, yeah, uh, there's kind of like this this I don't know that I, if I remember it's been a long time since I've seen it, but then that then that creature really didn't didn't have any arms and legs and it was still trying to crawl. I uh, think so. It, it had like appendages, you know, but they were they were short and stubby. It's like they just weren't fully formed. There's something in the parasite that's not fully formed that does that. And Ramsey writes that shit like fucking top notch. I mean, it'll make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. And and I've read I'm reading this book, you know, probably I was probably about 18, 19 uh when I read it and it just, I was like, oh my God, this is the best shit I've ever read. And it, it's, it's just, I don't know, man, to be able to, 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 to capture that. And that's one of the things that he does. That's so cool is that he'll write about the most mundane thing in the world and make it possibly ambiguously creepy. And to be able to write it at that level where you're working on, on a surface and underneath the surface at the same time. And he just pulls it off. Like it's just nothing, you know, or it yeah. seemed like that reading yeah. it. I mean, maybe it was pure torture trying to write it, but you know, um, that's just, that's some fine shit, man. Yeah. He, I read, there's a scene in the doll who ate, um, his mother that, I, mm-hmm. it, it's like they're dancing in the ba- did you read that one it's like they're dancing in the basement there's like clay I can't remember exactly what it was but I, I, I was reading that in the last house Allison and I lived at and I had to like stop like in and you guys know it's you're always yeah. looking for that right you're looking for that moment of like oh sh- oh shit that was like like I'm like actually like yeah. scared like I'm mm-hmm. not I'm not just like oh that was good it's no it's like more like um <clears throat> Allison you know, Allison, uh, uh, what are you, what are you doing? Uh, what do you mean? What am I doing? You know, it's like, I'm, I'm just wondering, what are you doing? You know, because you're like, you're like scared to be alone all of a sudden that happened to me with that one. I started reading the parasite out loud to her and then my dog ate it. Um, but then I got enough. <laughs> um, I read a sweet ass thing, um, that he like curated called fine frights, like a book of collection of short stories that he loves. And that was amazing. Um, mm-hmm. I just really like that guy and the way that he writes and it's all just he's one of those guys that have taught me um in terms of because i feel like there's a tendency when you begin as a horror author to make sort of the scare like a centerpiece right or everything is leading up to the scare but then a guy like ramsey campbell has taught me that like no 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 you you have your scene and then you that is slid into the scene it doesn't have to be like you know it's like the guy's heading towards the door puts his hand on the knob opens the door there's the monster right no mm-hmm. it's like it's more like on his way to that door and he puts his hand on the knob and he's like wait a minute what did, did i what did i do did i see a face in the bush on the way to this door like that he's like it's like things are more like like just like not understated that's not the right word it's just mm-hmm. it's so classy in, in how it's done and it's like whoa it's almost like he writes in the, like out of the you you experience the scene out of the corner of your eye, right, right. I mean, and he'll and he'll write stuff that make you read a sentence again, not because you didn't understand it. You fully understood what you read. Yeah, but you'll read it again in the hopes that you can get that same sensation again. Yeah, and usually you can. I mean, it's like one one sentence, and, I, and I'm I'm probably gonna butcher it, and I, I'm probably getting the, the wrong thing. But just to give you an idea, is there was someone that were in a car that were going down the highway, 
and they noticed there was like a crane working on something. And the way he described the crane with its arm bent and lifted over was like a spider leg. And it was just like, you're like going, huh? And it kind of gives you an insight to the character's state of mind as sure. well. Because yep. you're seeing it from their perspective. And you know that their perspective may not be very reliable. And that that causes a lot of suspense right there. Yeah, I, I well, I wrote down Incarnate. I'm gonna I'm gonna read that one. I'm uh I think I have it. If you hear my voice, I'm I'm looking at this big mountain of awesome <laughs> books to be read, and I think it's in this stack actually. So I think because it's kind of a longer one, that one, isn't it? It's like five hundred. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna, I think I may check that one out. That one and another one that I really need to read is the ceremonies. I, I gotta read the ceremonies already. That one is. Do you mean by by? T E D Klein? Yeah. Yep. You haven't read the the ceremonies? I know, dude. That one is like a major gap <laughs> for me. That one has been it's just I don't know what it is. You know how like you'll turn around and you're like, why the hell have I never read this, right? That one has always just slipped by. And well, I, it's let's, time. It's like let's time. do this. Let's do this. This is this will be really cool. Because have you ever read the events at Port Farm? Yes. Yep. Okay. I figured you had. So now keep that in your mind and read the read the ceremonies be, because a nice chunk of the events of Port Farm are in the ceremonies. Well, really, it's, it's basically that story expanded out to its near impossible length. I got it right here. I went and got it while you while you were just talking. Mm-hmm. The first sign is the forest was ablaze. <laughs> yeah. Prologue, Christmas, the four- so I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but what we're really doing tonight is I'm just going to read the ceremonies for the next <laughs> 19 hours. <laughs> that would be an amazing thing to just like have to read this whole book live, <laughs> like on Facebook Live while Allison flies me with like cocaine and coffee or something. And then, no, 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 that's too much. But, <laughs> but. I would, I would, but I would like to, um, I, maybe I won't, God, now, the way you asked why I hadn't read this made me feel like this has got to be next. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's just, uh, it's, the, it's really hard for me, I love the book, so it's really hard for me to be critical about it, and to be realistic about it, um, but to be, okay, let's, let's go ahead and be 100% honest about it, the ending is a little rushed, uh, but it's the journey that really sends it home. Oh, dude, I'm on it, dude. I'm doing it. I'm doing it because because there's so many because there's so many great 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 books that when you look back, you can sit back and go, you know, they kind of rushed the ending. Yeah, you I've know, done. It didn't really I've stick done exactly. But here's the thing: you got you got to give him credit. We're talking about T. E. D. Klein. The guy whose most famous quote is, I will literally do anything I can to avoid writing. Yeah, yeah. I've heard that. And he, and he stuck with this book for hundreds of pages. So that that means something. <laughs> you know? I watched him on Eating the Fantastic with Scott. Mm-hmm. Have you ever seen, yeah. you've seen that episode? Mm-hmm. Wow. That was wild because – it's just an interesting he he's like such a New Yorker and and um they're in like a deli and he's like smacking his lips, you know, eating while he's talking the whole time and and um and you're like this dude what an interesting role this guy's had in the history of horror, you know. Wrote some of the most like celebrated, most respected stuff in one of the most celebrated eras, but yet none of us know that much about him. No, he didn't write that many books. He just a very interesting slot that he fills in horror history, you know? Right. I mean, it's like kind of like Ira Levine. He didn't write that many books. Yeah. But what he wrote was was incredible. And wasn't Klein also the um, editor of Twilight Zone, the magazine? Wasn't he? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. He was yeah. the editor, one of the uh, – he was the fiction editor. And then he went on to work for GQ, I think, 
or well, one of one of them. Yeah, just like totally different thing. He was a um, uh, and I hate and I don't, don't want to get it wrong, but what I remember reading is he was a fashion editor for fashion articles, not for like photos or things like that. It was for actual articles. And so he had like a team of, of columnists that he had to, to you know, work with monthly. Uh, and I, if I'm wrong about that, then someone please correct me. But that's 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 what I remember reading. It was like as he almost disappeared off the face of the earth. And I want to say that it was on a Facebook post by Richard Chismar. I think we were chatting about that on Facebook back in the day. And someone said, "Well, no, no, no. He he works for so and so now." Okay. Like, huh? Okay. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's it's you know, it's funny. You know, it's it's very easy for me to be like, I don't understand. Why wouldn't somebody just want to write like a thousand books in their lives and and like put out ten books a year and keep going until they like you know fall to dust? But I mean, everyone's got their own experience, man. And and like you said. His famous quote is, he'll do absolutely anything to not write. Well, this guy wrote, like, a, a, I'm looking at it right now, a giant, like, you know, book that's, like, crazily respected in the genre. And it's like, isn't that isn't that good enough, Josh? Yes, that's good enough. And, and it's like, but it's funny when you hear of something like that as a prolific, you, there's a side of you that's like, I don't get it. Why, don't, why didn't he write more? I don't get it, you know? But it's like because um, he's a different person than you, dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, he after he discovered like David J. Scow, you know, uh, and it's funny because in David J. Scow's collection, he talks about how David broke every one of his rules when he was working at Twilight Zone magazine. You know, because he said, you know, hey, I set up some rules, no stories about Vietnam vets, no stories about movies, no stories about that. He goes, and this son of a bitch breaks every single one of them, and I have to literally publish them because he's that good. Is that from <laughs> that collection, Seeing Red? Yes. <laughs> that one, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is, the, that is the bomb. Yeah, that guy, man. And he's also awesome online, by the way, like on, on social media. I just like, like, I don't know. Anytime I uh, see a comment or, or anything by him, I'm always like thrilled. <laughs> no, by Scow, yeah. he's He doesn't show up very often. I've been to KillerCon twice, hoping to, to catch him both times. And uh, the first uh, the first time, uh, I think his uh, daughter was having a knee surgery or something like that. And there was just absolutely no way that he was going to miss that. And then the second time something else happened and uh, there was absolutely no way he was going to miss that. So it was just bad timing. And of course now, you know, we have like extremely bad timing, but we might, I mean, who knows? They, they might have him on, on the, the online version of killer con. So who knows? Yeah. I would love to see that. I'm dude, it's, you really got me like, you know how you um like your mind will get snagged. Like I'm I'm holding the ceremonies like I'm just like, look, I'm like, it's time. Here we go. Yeah, you got me. It's not it's happening. But you can't now. read it right. Like right now. You have to wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm reading. We can talk amongst yourselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to This Is Horror with the wonderful Josh Malaman. Of course, if you would like to listen to part two now, if you would like to listen to every episode ahead of the crowd, then become our patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Not only do you get early bird access to each episode, but you get to submit questions to each and every interviewee. And we have a number of exciting guests coming up. We're going to be talking to David Cummings of No Sleep Podcast, Rena Mason, Gemma Amore, and many, many more people. So if you want to submit questions to them or other Masters of Horror, then consider being our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Okay, before I wrap up, quick word from our sponsors. Being an independent publisher, we are just like you. We share the same passion, the same love for horror fiction. We believe in the incredible work being created 
unnoticed by the mainstream. And we want to share it with the world. We are the Sinister Horror Company. Save Nightscape Press from going out of business. Help fund Sacred Gateways in the Color Trade paperback edition of Nox Paradolio. Nightscape Press has been publishing quality weird and horror fiction since 2012, with an emphasis on supporting notable charities. Search for Secret Gateways on Kickstarter and support to receive rare and awesome perks at various tiers, ebook bundles, paperback and hardcover editions, signed chapbooks, and more. Thank you for your support. Now, recently, I've been closing with some of my tweets that seem to be resonating with you good people. So I'm going to do it again. It's my attempt to to share some wisdom in terms of creativity and writing advice. And I'm probably going to keep doing this until someone gives me feedback, which, which would be great. I mean, either let me know, hey, this is working. Keep, keep sharing your wisdom or tell me to get back to giving quotes from classic writers, which, well, I guess I've been doing for hundreds of episodes now. If there's another way that you'd like me to close out the show, then share that with me as well. I mean, This Is Horror podcast has always been a collaboration, in a sense, between listener and host and guest. We're always looking for your feedback, so please let me know how you're getting on at Wilson the Writer. But for now, here is a little tidbit that I shared on Twitter that some of you seem to have responded quite well to. When you get to that uncertain place where you're unsure whether a story is total rubbish or if there's something there, that is when it's worth pursuing. Creativity shines when you're uncomfortable. I'll see you in the next episode for part two with Josh Malaman. But until then, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.